Welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke. I'm a landscape architect and I'm also the coordinator of these brown bags. The videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed was a historic preservation planner in the city in the Lincoln City and County Government from 1985 to 2020. Since retiring, Ed remains an active community historian and volunteer. He recently has finished two books, the third and final volume of the Near South Walking Tour book and a book on Lincoln Postcards with Jim McKee. Ed is native to Omaha, Nebraska and has an undergraduate degree from Lindenwood College and a PhD from Boston University. Ed's talk today is Built for Learning, an Architectural History, History of Lincoln Public Schools. Please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you for being here. This was planned. I, I'm looking for the setup that will block my view completely, and you'll only be able to see the pictures. That would be the shy guy presentation. But we're working towards that step by step. That's kidding. And as soon as I get this working for me, we've only got 200 slides, so I'm hoping for success here. It's advancing here, but it's not showing up on the screen advancing. There you have it for a moment. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it gets like glitchy. Yeah, so. This is to make Jim feel good about carousels and supposed PowerPoint. Um, we had we always have trouble with them jamming and the slides upside down too. And <laughs> so this is my standard opening to guide us back into Lincoln history, uh, using the Capitol as our landmark in every sense um, because it takes us back to the second capital, the 1880s capital, and from there we can step back to the first capital because the history of LPS goes back ba basically as far as the history of Lincoln. And th this capital was built by the Capitol Commission, the three constitutional officers who had the additional duty of getting the capital city, small a, cap, two A's capital, and the Capitol, with an O, built. Uh, the Governor Butler, Secretary of State Kennard, and Auditor Gillespie. And they, ha they commissioned and drew up a plat. This is the original plat of Lincoln. Within the old part of the city, the land still is governed by the legal descriptions established in 1867 by this plat, which looks like a waffle. A pure grid city, what kind of, how much thinking does it take to draw a pure grid city? Well, there's really a lot of planning built into this, including planning for the public schools. They established within the, capital, within the original plan a capital site. That's where all three of the capitals have stood, uh, including the present building sitting on that super block. It's essentially four of the original uh, residential blocks of the city. The, the blocks throughout the city are 300 feet by 300 feet. This block is 640, or 740, two 300s, and a 120-foot no, right-of-way in the middle. So six, 720 by 720 was the size of this piece of ground within the curbs. They established three blocks for units of local government or functions of local government, county courthouse, and we are 
meeting here on the county courthouse block of the 1867 plan. So we're where they sent us in 1867. North of that became the federal block that originally was laid out to be the market square that visitors to town and farmers and farmers market operators could be on market square. We know that as government square where old city hall and the old federal building Grand Manse now stand. And then north of that was the Library Association and Historical Block. And that's the one recently cleared from the Journal Star Printing and Distribution Block. And I think a Drury Hotel is slated for that block today. Uh, the other two of those three are still in public function. A campus for the not yet founded University of Nebraska, uh, and Jim has an interesting approach and talk about all the other cities that were going to have the University of Nebraska, but nothing ever happened on those. This one, two years later, um, a campus building, campus was established and the University Hall, the original building of the University of Nebraska, beginning to be constructed in 1869 and opened by about 71, designed by Matthew John Bur McBird of Indiana. You've got to imagine this little place that only has basically a map starts to try to build all these buildings and they often have to bring in from Chicago or Indiana the architects to design the buildings. There's the original campus building by McBird. And then getting to our focus of the I wouldn't call it K-12 system yet because it was really a first grade through high school. Kindergarten is an innovation of a little bit later. But the public school system was given six blocks within this original plan on which to build public school buildings. And rather remarkably, three of those blocks still today have school ki public school kids on those blocks today. But that's where we will start is building on those blocks South of the Capitol Square, the blue square, was labeled high school. Instead, they built the first high school north of the Capitol on what was labeled common school, meaning one through eight, what we call elementary, or now it's elementary plus middle. And that's the block where uh, Lincoln High was built beginning in 1871, opened by about 1872 um, on the block that we would know as Pershing or now we would know as where Pershing used to be, um, to, to stay current. Uh, the architects of the first Lincoln High School were Artemis Roberts and his brother-in-law, James Belange, uh, he, both of them who lived to considerable age beyond, well, remarkable age in Roberts' case. He lives to 1944. His brother-in-law lives to 1915, and they're photographed here, I think, quite a bit later in their lives. They're pretty young men in 1871 um, when they build this high school building. Um, they were brothers-in-law, um, both Robert's first wife and second wife were sisters of Mr. Belange in sort of biblical ways when first wife, when, he was, when Roberts was widowed with wee young children, his sister-in-law, the aunt of the kids, um, married Roberts, and so first and second wives, and is that twice brother-in-law? Um, he, he was only brother once, but twice uh, married two sisters in succession at an appropriate time. Uh, Roberts operates very long. He's the first uh, uh, established architect in Lincoln who's resident, but not coming in from somewhere else, but comes and lives and stays, and then Roberts is here until the early uh, the first decade of the 20th century, last big project was Fairview for William Jennings Bryan. Then he moves on and retires to Florida about 1904 or 5, and for four more decades lives and builds architecture and comes back occasionally to Lincoln and builds for his sons, um, J.R. Roberts of Roberts Dairy, and Charles Roberts, who, for whom he builds a big house on Sheridan Boulevard. So Roberts is with us a long time. The school buildings beyond the high school um, start not on those assigned six blocks, but on another block, because often they're needing to position a school where 
the house, the residents are starting to go up. And this was one of the first elementaries, first common schools built, originally known as the 9th and T Street School, which gives you everything you needed to know about it. Um, and often the teachers at these schools named for a location would petition the school board and say, really, 9th and T? Uh, how do we be the 9th and T Terriers or um, Ninths or what? It becomes Bancroft School by name later, and then is a new Bancroft is built in replacement of this school. James Tyler, an English-born architect who had come to Lincoln in the 1870s, um, designs this and a couple other uh, LPS schools. Trying to picture where that was, Ninth and T is a little hard to put on a current day mental map. Um, if we look back at one of the bird's eye views, that's the uh, campus building on the right edge. And so we're north and somewhat west of where the um, original um, University Hall stood on its campus. The site becomes, in fact, the school building itself becomes part of Northwest Metal, Iron and Metal, a scrapyard. Um, sometimes you hear about uh, lead pollution in North Bottoms from a smeltery. This was that smeltery. Uh, looking at that big complex that eventually developed there, much of the red, much of the pink on this Sanborn Atlas is that school building, and then the scrapyard extended and built all around it. But to really get you oriented to it on a modern mental map, that's the south end of the stadium. The parking garage is more or less where the 9th and T Bancroft School stood. You can't go to school there. Well, you, you, can, go to, you can park there to go to school. Uh, another of the very early buildings, we're in the 1880s, the city has grown fairly rapidly through the 1870s and then just explodes in the 1880s. Population has reached about 13,000 by the 1880 census, is 55,000 by the 1890 census. So they're building schools almost every year or more than one school a year to keep up with the population growth through the 1880s. Park Elementary of 1882, um, north of the park, the third of the super blocks, um, originally called Lincoln Park or um, F Street Park and today Cooper Park is that third of the big super blocks. And this sat right on the north edge of that where still today Park, but Park Middle School sits. And we'll get around to building that. Um, there was a frame school built over at First and K called Longfellow. Uh, Longfellow and First and K didn't get along real well. The creek kept coming and visiting the school, um, but they uh, built it originally in frame and uh, we will replace it in um, nice, sturdy, but still not floodproof uh, concrete and brick construction um, about 30 years later. So it, it took 30 years to learn that this was not a good location. Um, and then um, still in the early 1880s, they built Capitol School just south of the Capitol on what would have been the original high school site. Uh, and we see it there. We're on the second Capitol looking down Goodhue Mall, uh, Goodhue Boulevard, uh, or what was then South 15th Street. And the school uh, sits a block south of the Capitol. Looking at it a little closer, um, and behind it, those two little buildings would have been the brick outhouses. Um, so if something's built like a brick outhouse, this is what it's supposed to look like. Roberts designed that building. Um, and then mid-1880s, and they have some trouble with this one. They have a foundation under one contract. The foundation doesn't get built. Roberts is, is given the additional task of seeing to get the foundation built and finished. Um, and then other con local contractors build the school building. But this originally was Capitol School. You would know the site um, as McPhee. Bryant Elementary, um, where uh, fire station number one um, is today, um, built in the mid 18 or the late 1880s, um, and it's designed by the, the Ar Lincoln architects uh, William Gray and uh, Otis Placey, uh, and it looks kind of like a courthouse. 
because they were courthouse builders. Uh, this was the York County Courthouse. Um, you have to imagine a little bit taller tower to be a courthouse, but it's an elementary school building that looked a lot like a courthouse. Um, down on 11th and C, renamed eventually Everett School, and that's the site today of Everett Elementary, although the building will have to build for you in just a few, a few more slides as Everett Junior High. Uh, it was 1887. And here's the Everett football team, although well, I think this is probably the neighborhood team. These are not all elementary kids. Some of them are, um, many of them are not. Uh, but this is one of those fabulous John Johnson photos of, of guys on the steps of Everett Elementary. And by this time, they're building schools so rapidly that like LPS has done in more recent years, several of them are built from the same design. Um, and Everett and the original 26th and O, better known as Elliott, um, not the Elliott location today, but the predecessor to the Elliott Elementary. This is built very much along the Everett plan. You really have to look carefully to sort between the two of them um, up at 26th and O. Today there's a little building and then a building that I think is a ballet um, uh, club and studio. The, that was built as a Safeway store, and the little building was built as the gas station beside it. So th those are the successor buildings on the footprint of this school building. I love the McPhee name. Um, that was for Phoebe, I'm sorry, Elliot. Phoebe Elliot, who was the first woman on the LPS school board, soon after women's suffrage partial was allowed in Nebraska, women could only vote in school elections. And Phoebe Elliott was a local businesswoman. She owned downtown property. Her brother had a store in her building downtown, and she was a leading local woman and a suffrage leader and a founder of the Lincoln Women's Club. And she's on the school board. And while on the school board, her colleagues named the school for their first woman colleague, Phoebe Elliott. And then also by the end of the 1880s, Cherry Street, which becomes renamed Sumner Street, although I don't think they ever called it Sumner Street School because by that time they had renamed it Prescott School. Um, and this was up at, at 20th Street and Sumner. Today there are apartment buildings of, the, well, an apartment building and duplexes and fourplexes of the 1920s and 30s on the site where this was um, supplanted by the modern Prescott School of 1922. We'll, get, we'll build that one in a few more slides as well. Uh, this one is built by Gray of um, Gray and Placey. And Gray does a bunch of courthouses on his own account uh, without Placey, including the Cass County Courthouse. And I think if you look at the old Prescott and put a tower up the middle, you've got just about the Cass County Courthouse. Uh, he, also, he also did the um, Johnson County in Tecumseh, um, and we see it here in red brick, which would have been what the Prescott School was as well. And then up on the northeast part of town, all the way at 27th and Holdridge, northeast, mm, starting towards the northeast, uh, well, it's about um, 29th and Holdridge, uh, is Clinton Elementary of 1891. And here they've gone out of town for their architects um, to a kind of regional company, W.R. Parsons and Sons, who built lots of school buildings and some courthouses, but were not a Lincoln firm. They had, they had reached over to um, an Iowa firm for Clinton Elementary in its original version, on the site of Clinton Elementary today. Whittier, originally the name was from the nearby street and was on an elementary at 23rd and Vine, um, built in the uh, early 1890s. The city had been growing rapidly. 1893 is a key year because that's when the crash followed the boom. And that crash was nationwide. In Lincoln, a third of the population left town during the subsequent years of the 1890s. So by the, 1890, by the 1900 census, population dropped from that high of about 55,000 to 39,000. 
So 13,000 to 55, back down to 39. It was a tough decade. Uh, but this was one of the last schools built of the boom. Uh, I think there's, there's one more. And that's Saratoga, which is built pretty much on the original, the first Saratoga. And this school has been built over more times, uh, and there's less visible of some of those early stages than almost any of the others. But this is the early Saratoga matching the early Whittier, neither of which we would recognize, even though we have Whittier and Saratoga still in the community today. But this is the original Saratoga Elementary just at the beginning of the crash. Um, that was a nationwide, they call it the Panic of 1893, and it really um, affected the whole country. Not built, but you, so you should not recognize the second Lincoln High, but this was the 1893-94 Ferdinand Fisk design. Before the crash, they, were, they had already outgrown the original Lincoln High um, down on 15th Street. Uh, and started efforts, including passing a $100,000 bond issue to build a new Lincoln High School. Uh, Fisk, uh, Ferdinand Fisk gets the design. He uh, relatively newly arrived in Lincoln by that time. He came in the late 1880s, um, academically trained. He graduated from Cornell, very talented architect, and gets the commission to design the new Lincoln High School for what we'd call the Pershing site. Offers them this design. Uh, and it gets published as far even as the plan and how they're going to arrange the spaces and the classrooms and all that. And then the panic strikes. And you can see in the newspaper accounts almost month to month, they pass a $100,000 bond issue. They hire the architect. They go out for bids. The bids come back in. They have another meeting. They cut down the, the bond to 75000 The bond is ruled illegal, and it's... And it's and it's burned. It, it is, it, the documents are, are discarded. 1895, Fisk sues the school board for, I think it was $1,350. They owed him for the design work he'd already done on the school building when they hired him under contract to design it. That case drags on for five years. He finally gets a favorable judgment by the state Supreme Court in 1900. He had left town by that time, at least briefly, very little building was going on in Lincoln in the 1890s, uh, and Fisk has paperwork still back in town and a bill he would like to see paid. What's remarkable is he, he wins that case and then builds lots more schools in Lincoln after he returns kind of and fully is practicing here in the new century. But this is this Lincoln High School that was not built. On its site, on the site of the original building, Two more buildings are added, uh, one that's described as, in the newspaper says, the new high school. But it's not a $100,000 building or a $75,000 building. It's about a, a $20,000 building. And it's mostly administrative offices, but it's some classroom space. And it's attached by a skywalk to the old building. Uh, that's on the north part of the block. And on the south part of the block, um, a new elementary is added until there are three buildings on that single block, um, the high school and, and McKinley Elementary. Um, the elementary designed by uh, Leach and Plym. Um, Leach was in town quite a long time, Marcus Leach. Plym, his young partner, goes on to other things, including manufacturing and selling, becoming incredibly wealthy with what are called Conair storefronts and doors and windows. And I think Alcoa still has a line they call Conair. That was Mr. Plim's uh, claim to fame and claim to wealth. Here's kids on the grounds, probably from McKinley School, but they're on the grounds of the high school beside it. Um, in some of these pictures, they're all sitting with their birdhouse, little shop class project. <laughs> uh, this is a look at what the site looked like. Um, this would be west to the top, north to the right. But the high, old high school in the middle, the uh, here labeled as capital or central school, but they also called it McKinley more often, and then the administration and classroom building to the north, connected by literally a skywalk at the second floor level. And there's uh, the three buildings on the site, elementary in the foreground, high school in the middle, and the addition on the north. 
turn of the century, the, city, the economy improves and the city starts to grow again and particularly growing into new neighborhoods. And a Randolph Elementary is built on Randolph Street. You wonder why that building over on D Street's called Randolph. That's because this was the first Randolph on what's known now as American Legion Park. They were on the west half of that block. Um, and um, Leach designed this building. Uh, here's the map showing still private uses on the 27th Street frontage, but now it's all park ground, uh, corner to corner. In the North Bottoms, where the growing German from Russian population um, has lots of little kids needing education, and they're on the wrong side of the railroad tracks, um, busy tracks separating them from the university. Um, a new school is built at 9th and Z. Z is renamed Charleston Street, um, and the school is eventually renamed Hayward School. Um, it's the oldest LPS-built structure still standing, not in school use, um, but it was in very busy school use in the early 20th century. It was one of the schools where the German from Russian beet field children um, went to school. And those are the kids whose families were working the sugar beet fields of western Nebraska and the Dakotas. And they would leave in the spring for planting, work all summer for weeding, still be working for harvesting in the fall. And their school year was compressed on both ends. And so this school and and one of the South Bottom schools had special sessions for a compressed curriculum to get kids through a year's worth of work in seven or eight months. Um, went on until the 1920s when the State Department of Education said that's institutionalized truancy. Um, it also was a good social response or school response to the situation of the families around them. By the 20s, I think the need was probably passing as well. Uh, they not only used uh, both some of the North and South Bottom schools for the kids, but also uh, for some adult education, which I'll show you. Um, this is the Craddock, James Craddock portion of Hayward School, that centerpiece um, with long additions now on either end of it. But this, uh, with um, a nice terracotta entrance, was Craddock's four-room school building for the original Hayward. And this is an adult education class. They offered citizenship classes. Before World War I, they offered German language classes. All of that went away, of course, um, during World War I. But this is a Hayward citizenship class about 1906. Um, about the same time as Lincoln High is being built, they make a South addition to Hayward School. Um, Craddock's portion is there in the middle. Um, Berlinghoff and Davis add the whole south portion, which is a tall centerpiece where there was a gymnasium, and then a portion matching the basic uh, shape and size of the original Craddock piece. So it was kind of a balanced design um, when uh, Berlinghoff and Davis were done with it. And then a north end was needed for more classroom um, in 1925, and Fisk, McGinnis, and Schomburg designed that, and I give you Harry McGinnis for that north portion of the building. So they'd been building that building for 21 years in three main stages as the neighborhood and the neighborhood need grew. This is the one that uh, was converted to condos in the mid-1980s and still is a, a residential building today. Burlinghoff and Davis come back in as well for the new Bancroft. This is the old Bancroft. It was renamed in 1890. And then a new Bancroft replaces it um, north of campus um, as a, a K-8, sometimes referred to as a junior high, although really it was offering that at that time <coughs> kindergarten through eighth grade, but had some of the new modern junior high features of shop classes and things in, um, encompassed within this building. This became Bancroft Hall later on the university grounds and now I think is a green space or has been built on green space hard to keep track of it. Um, but Bancroft Hall is gone. Burlinghoff and Davis designed it. Uh, and you know it was an important building because it got postcards issued. Um, very handsome, um, heavy, heavy construction, but on the growing, it really was right on the edge of campus as it was built. And then uh, campus growth um, superseded the, 
the public the elementary level public school building. And then Berlinghoff and Davis, in their in one of their great designs, give us Lincoln High School of 1913-1915. Uh, this is the um, F. W. Fitzpatrick rendering for it, uh, putting the names of the designers on. And there's our George Berlinghoff, German immigrant, uh, about a generation older than young Ellery Davis, um, but they have a very productive about six or seven years together, 1911 and 1917, uh, designing um, public buildings, university buildings, the old law building, the west part of Architecture Hall um, is Berlinghoff and Davis. They did Bancroft, they did Lincoln High, uh, they did Miller and Payne, first two stages of buildings. So lots of very fine work. And then they separate um, and both continue to do um, very productive additional decades of architecture. Um, Lincoln High, um, sometimes when they get around to ranking handsome old high schools, this one's always on the list. Um, and just, I think, uh, in a well-maintained and beautiful school building. The original drawings showed in the basement um, separate gyms for, the, for boys and girls, and then some of the HVAC equipment in the center in the basement. But instead, they decide, let's put not a pool, a plunge. And a plunge was a swimming pool by another name, but plunge was a specific sort, not the swimming that Bob Ripley would do. Plunge was for big guys with lots of floating ability, and it was how long could you float from one jump into the pool without moving. Um, it was labeled plunge. And this was a Lincoln plunge champion, and, and apparently this was the, the physical configuration of a really great plunge um, athlete. It was an Olympic sport for a while, but they said it was one of the most boring sports <laughs> to watch, because you just waited and waited and waited. I wouldn't be any good at plunge at all, just none, none. Here's a school under construction, um, opens in 1915. Uh, with a beautiful cornerstone um, donated by a previous class uh, with 1913 as the beginning date of construction. And then another of the John Johnson photos, um, this we know is Lincoln High because of the stone frames of the doors and the lamps beside the doors. But these aren't high school kids. I think they're there for a music recital. When you zoom all the way in on this picture, you can see um, a couple of the girls are holding rolled up sheet music. I think one of them says easy piano pieces. So maybe they are going inside, um, not to the plunge, but into the grand auditorium um, in the center of the building. Uh, that's the level above. The plunge is now the media center um, on the ground level of Lincoln High. And above it, uh, we still have that beautiful auditorium uh, refurbished and, and polished up as the new, as the new high schools are being built um, LPS tried to go back into the existing high schools and do needed work, including bringing up to um, kind of a similar level of education the facilities like auditoriums. And so you needed things like up in the ceiling, places you could position lights. And they left the beautiful Davis and Wil um, Berlinghoff and Davis design, but replaced some of it with um, transparent. Um, grids and screens so that you could walk across them and aim the lights and do all the work. This was the auditorium we renamed the Ted Sorensen um, Theater. And still with its beautiful 1913-1915 uh, plaster work and lamps. Longfellow, which I mentioned, kept suffering flood damage. Um, Apparently 12 school buildings uh, were damaged in a flood of 1908. Um, this one almost floated away. It said the buildings were underwater to a considerable depth and narrowly escaped being washed away. And it was replaced with a much sturdier Longfellow Elementary in 1918. But sturdy doesn't matter a whole lot if you're going to get wet every time it floods. Um, and this building um, stands no longer. It wasn't washed away, but it was closed because the location just was not a reasonable one for 
uh, permanent use building. But this is Harry McGinnis' design for Longfellow Elementary of 1918. Uh, he had been working with Fisk uh, from about 19, um, well, about 1902 or 3, um, and they partner um, all the way up to 1924. There's Longfellow Elementary um, and a citizenship class for the women of that neighborhood um, outside Longfellow Elementary. On, at West a, on West A at Folsom, um, the West A school building was built in 1904-1905, same time as Craddock was doing the first portion of Hayward, a uh, handsome wood frame building. Um, the teachers there petitioned the board um, to rename it um, as for Willard, um, Women's Temperage Leader. Um, they succeed at that in 1915. And in 1916, the poor building burns down. So they lose this handsome little building. But it is replaced um, in 1918, 1919 uh, with a building rather similar. This, this is on my list of buildings I cannot yet document the architect. The building still stands. Um, it looks like it's probably Fisk and McGinnis, um, but I haven't found that documented yet. And you can see that school building feature where you'll have blank brickwork panels beside an entrance probably the blackboard ends of each classroom um, against that blank wall. And that still stands there as the Willard Community Center, but not in LPS use anymore. Now in the beginning, in the end of the teens, the beginning of the 20s, it was again a very busy building time, and a lot of the building activity is new growth in the neighborhoods, but some of it is replacing the rapidly built buildings of the 1890s. And it seems like it's sort of early to have to replace the 1880s and 1890s buildings. Um, but there's also a considerable advance in building technology over that period. Lincoln High is the first, I believe, the first uh, LPS building built of reinforced concrete um, with a, then a brick veneer to the outside. So it's a very heavily built, very sturdy building which allows it to keep being adapted. You can't make the classrooms bigger, but you can keep rebuilding it um, in that existing sturdy frame. And much of what's happening in the late teens, early 20s, a couple of big bond issues are passed and they start replacing the failing buildings um, and building into new neighborhoods where it's needed. They also adopt um, a, what, what the educators call the 633 configuration, meaning elementary for sixth grades, three grades of middle school, three grades of high school. And that's a 1912 um, adaptation. Uh, they passed a bond issue uh, with 76% approval in 1919 for $2 million to start this building campaign. It was a 10-year plan, but they, as they got building it, they have to pass another bond issue a few years later because there was just so much building going on. So we have in this 1912 view, Park and Elliott, Everett, all of which will remain in name, but not in this building. McKinley gets replaced, Prescott gets rebuilt new, Clinton gets rebuilt new. So five of the six. And a lot of that work is done by Fisk, uh, who's come back to Lincoln uh, from a time in St. Louis and uh, Cedar Rapids, um, and then um, building with a partner from Cedar Rapids up to about 1910, Fisk and Demon, and then from 1911 to 25, uh, Fisk and McGinnis. Mo McGinnis is always w with him, but um, not full partner until mid-teens. First building Fisk and McGinnis do together um, is Hartley Elementary. Uh, this one gets started and then has a delay while they uh, adjudicate whether the bond issue uh, was legitimate. Um, and so they design it, but it takes a couple more years to build it. But Hartley is named for the superintendent who had built most of those buildings in the 1880s um, and then in the crash of the 1890s comes back on the school board. Courage to have served both as superintendent and a school board member. Superintendent during the boom, school board member during the bust. Uh, he deserves a school named for him. Um, <laughs> E.T. Hartley is buried at Wyuka, and his building is still that beautiful portion 
um, of Hartley with a big wing on the north um, and then in addition with gyms and such to the south. Um, so we will um, next rebuild Prescott, uh, a Fisk and McGinnis design a couple blocks south of the old Prescott up on Sumner Street. Uh, this one moves down uh, just across from um, Harwood Street. Uh, here's their drawing and the beautiful brick and terracotta centerpiece um, of Prescott uh, with its name in terracotta across the front. They also get the, Fisk and McGinnis get the commission for Elliott School, um, a rather unusual design because of its placement. It basically has two grand fronts. One of them is the back, but that back happens to be towards the creek and downtown and the Capitol. And so the big drawings show that, and postcards show this beautiful uh, three-story portion, or three-and-a-half-story portion, and it's really facing towards the playground um, Muni Pool, no longer there, now Telegraph District, but across the valley to downtown and the Capitol. This is the other side. This is the functional front um, towards the neighborhood, um, similarly um, decked out in terracotta, um, but without that um, added kind of tower feature. And some beautiful terracotta work there, the name, the date, um, and the Owls of Learning um, on the um, east uh, main entrance to Elliott. So they, take, they keep the good name of Phoebe Elliott from 26th and O and bring it over to 25th and N. And so we rebuilt Elliott. Um, up north in the Belmont neighborhood, there was a building very similar, a frame building very similar to the original frame Longfellow School. Uh, here it is uh, in its 1889 version. The district is annexed by Lincoln and a new Belmont school is built um, quite similar to uh, Hartley in its original design. And then not the first junior high in the country, but the first junior high purpose built um, in LPS and a very early junior high school is the beautiful Whittier. Uh, Fisk and McGinnis design it um, in terracotta and brick, heavy reinforced concrete construction. Again, when this ceases its public school function, sits empty, for, not t entirely empty, but empty-ish uh, for a good couple decades. And then the university that had acquired it um, puts it back into classroom use. But another of these very well-built, sturdy, lots to work with buildings um, and gives us that beautiful Whittier uh, here with the student body on the front steps. And you can still put them right on the front steps of the current building. Saratoga gets built and rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt again until we can't see the original piece, but in the center of the current building is a Fisk and McGinnis handsome period revival school building. They were doing often their elevations at that time. They would, they would draw half of the frontispiece, which then encourages you to put it up against, well, match it up to the photo because that's what they're envisioning in their mind's eye. The other half's going to be just like it. You don't have to draw the whole thing. And it has still, that's the center portion of Saratoga, and has still its 1923 um, date stone on it. Lakeview School, way out west, um, is being built in this same um, burst of buildings, early 1920s. But it's the one that the, ma the facilities people of LPS go to the board and say, you're hiring all these contractors to do the work we do all the time. We could build a school building. And the board says, well, build one out west. And LPS, with its own forces, not outside contractors, builds Lakeview, looking quite a bit like the rest of them, um, and a 1925 date stone on it. So it's not by outside contractors, but by their own forces. But so much is being built. Obviously, they wouldn't be maintaining internal employees to build all of these buildings at once. Um, Fisk, McGinnis, and Schomburg design um, Clinton Elementary. And you can see in the Fisk and McGinnis, they typically um, 
are building that grand centerpiece um, and often with additional height. Much emphasis on that. You're doing something important here. When you walk through this doorway, teachers or staff, you're, you're at some noble purpose. I like that message for a school building. Um, Clinton has its name over the door um, in rich terracotta as well, which they're drawn in the blueprint very exactingly and then get it executed with the date and name. So we can replace Clinton um, in our old view of the schools. And then a 1923 book comes out that's starting to show some of the new school buildings, but some of the um, old ones that still need to be replaced, like Randolph. And that gets rebuilt um, considerably about a mile um, east of uh, the old Randolph location, but keeps the name. This, the other firm doing lots of school work in this period and continuing after, not Fisk and McGinnis, but Davis and Wilson, uh, who in Davis and Burlinghoff configuration had done Lincoln High, but they're now going to pick up a lot of the uh, later teams and continuing all the way up. I know they built the new Huntington. I can't, I'd have to flip through my mental cards as to whether they built any of the later school buildings, but Davis Design is the direct successor to this firm. That building out in front, uh, the front portion was the gymnasium originally, um, gets converted to um, the media center and then I think may now, I think it's still the media center, um, but it's a nice, it's a beautiful um, use of that space um, with lots of work surrounding it and lots of additions to the playground backside. Davis and Wilson also designed Saratoga in 19, er, er, Sheridan in 1925-26. Uh, the city's growing east and southeast particularly. And this is the playground entrance to Sheridan uh, with the name over the door. And there's a beautiful uh, west elevation as well. This up a dead end street, very kind of very neighborhood entrance to the school building. Fisk um, separates from his younger partners in 1925 and does a little more work, a much smaller work typically, till his death in 1930. But uh, McGinnis and Schomburg continue very similar work to the earlier partnership, and they design um, the second junior high building for LPS, um, and that's Irving. And they still have that big, strong entrance feature, but it's not purely symmetrical. It's a little more collegiate Gothic in feel, um, but has a beautiful um, stone and terracotta um, entrance feature um, on Irving with this grand, um, you, you know it's important when you come up to that entrance. Um, and it's got a, got a lovely owl of learning up there as well. Um, with these little kind of, um, they look like junior high kids, kind of, um, holding up the shield. Um, and above it is the initials for Irving Junior High. Irving Junior High School, IJHS. Davis and Wilson get the Park School Rebuild Commission and design a unique um, U-shaped plan with the playground in the middle um, in its original configuration and that um, on the corner of the right wing um, that room with lots of little kind of louvered windows is the kindergarten room. It often had a feature like that um, and we see it up to the late days of, of Park Elementary. In about 1990 Park and Everett flipped functions and park which had access to the bigger park space beside it and could have play fields more appropriate to the bigger junior middle school kids becomes the middle school and Everett uh, more landlocked becomes the elementary again. Uh, the playground space or the uh, kindergarten um, kind of bay window remains um, and I should go back because I they've fixed up the window since this one but in the new construction, they add into that U-shaped portion uh, the media center, the offices, and some more classroom space. Um, and so that part of the playground goes away. Um, but they take features from the old building and limestone and the brickwork 
onto the new infill. And so we still recognize Park with its additions. So there's, there's Clinton replaced Elliott. And then another new school way east, all the way across 48th Street, um, is Hawthorne. The, I've circled in yellow here up on O Street where Petco is. There had been a frame school building, two room I think, um, that was originally um, Hawthorne. Um, and it's replaced with a nice Davison Wilson Colonial Revival Hawthorne down in the neighborhood. And here it is under construction. The neighborhood hasn't quite built around it as they put up that building. It gets there, but it's not there yet. Uh, but there's the handsome, kind of at a beautiful little crest of the hill, land falls away, um, almost every side of this uh, school building. Davis and Wilson also get the um, rebuild of Everett project, uh, and that's to build in place of the elementary, a junior high school, third of the LPS junior highs, uh, and still there today. Um, and it has now just recently gotten its um, indoor air quality work and its ground coupled heat pumps so that the windows could be uh, put back in better, better condition. And here they dug out a cellar to put all the heat pumps down there because they didn't want to, this is not a building that wanted a spine across the roof. And in Davis and Wilson fashion, um, there are the two blank ends uh, with beautiful limestone work and then a slogan at each end of the building. Uh, one of them reading, while you have youth and health and strength, fill your life with beautiful things. I think that's good advice even when you have age <laughs> and are trying to keep your health and your strength is diminishing, but you still want to fill your life with beautiful things. And the other one, an enlightened citizenry is our debt to American pioneers. There's a very similar building, almost the same plan, built in Kearney. Um, as their junior high, and now it's Kearney Central Elementary. Right in the middle of that building, as there had been in this building, was a huge uh, auditorium with a gymnasium-sized stage. Their gym was the stage, um, and then the auditorium led up to that. And that's how this one was built as well. On the exterior, they're very similar, all the way down to these two plaques, not the same slogans, but the same themes on the two wings in Kearney they redid their auditorium into their kind of smaller lead center. And they, their auditorium is still there um, and in use, and it's a, quite a special place. And then uh, we have to accommodate the uh, growth of Lincoln into the suburban towns uh, to the east. And we'll start with University Place uh, that comes in um, in 1924 uh, 26. This was um, a design offered by Burlinghoff and Davis for Jackson High School, not accepted. Uh, this would be one where um, F.W. Fitzpatrick drew a beautiful design and they didn't win the competition. And um, Ashley, a, an architect out of Columbus, I think it was, um, gets the J um, Jackson High design. This is in, on annexation taken into LPS there was also an elementary um, behind it, um, built in 1926 by Davis and Wilson, called Huntington. Um, so there was an elementary and a, and a high school on those grounds. They became together with additions filling in between them. Uh, Huntington Elementary that was torn down in the late 1980s. This configuration of buildings here and there, and some of them built with timber construction, uh, feeding termites. Uh, for the duration of their life. Um, the decision was to replace the, the whole complex with a Davis design for a new elementary school. So Huntington today, the name stays. It's another Davis building, um, but of a century, almost century later. Uh, there had been a, a John R. Smith elementary school for the town of University Place, the third ward. This became named Riley School. Riley School um, at about 49th, 50th, uh, right on the Mopac um, tra bike trail, uh, replaced this building uh, in the LPS system. In Bethany, um, an elementary and then a high school were built. The elementary is still there as part of the Cotner Center, um, annexed in 26 and became part of LPS. 
this, and then we'll get out to uh, Jernand, an Omaha architect, designed Bethany's schools. Uh, one of the few of the suburban town schools still at least a brick upon brick in the LPS system is Norwood Park. This was built by Havelock and is still with big, big extensions uh, in use, but this portion still stands and has some classrooms in it way out east of 70th Street. And then the Grand Havelock High School of 1917, the pride of Havelock, um, another Jernant design uh, with a beautiful cornerstone on it that eventually became, when Northeast High School was built, the Northeast Schools, the University Place, um, Havelock and Bethany were combined into the new Northeast High School uh, and this became, in its late years, uh, Goodyear Fitness Center. Um, and I'm not sure what it is today. I've lost track of this one. It's still there. It'll be, it, it is beautifully built, a very handsome building. And beside it, a little elementary built by LPS, but now I think a child care center. Um, and this was another Davis and Wilson design, um, built during the Depression with uh, PWA funding and another handsome um, colonial revival. And with that, I still have about 50 slides, but we get into a, a different era of school buildings. Um, and so, um, like Jim McKee, maybe I could come back for schools, yeah. schools number two. Um, but th th this, is, this gives you a taste of the architectural history of LPS. One of the most remarkable things, I think, is how many of these buildings are still in daily school use. And you hope that you keep building and maintaining buildings, that this is something the community is going to do as long as we're a community. One of the things I think COVID taught us, among many others, is that education works best when the children and the teacher are in the same physical space looking each other in the eye. Uh, there are other ways that education happens as well, but that's still a good model. And we have all these lovely buildings in which that's still happening. With that, I'll wrap up this session and um, we have to clear the room for the next meeting after. I can stand out in the hall if you have corrections, gentle corrections you want to offer or questions for which I'll make up answers, all that part of the process. Thank you. Thank you.